I think you've read a bit of an introduction on on me. So I've worked for the RSPB since 2000. So I've been around quite a long time and I'm that kind of interface. I'm an ornithologist. So I do a bit of bird ringing and things in my, my own time and also electronics qualified. So I kind of sit on both sides of the fence for you. So I'm sort of starting at a, a lowish level, but um, hopefully there'll be some interesting insights of, of what I've done and, and tips that m you might be able to take on board in the future. So yeah, 20 years, a long time in um, conservation, especially in conservation tech. So I've not been around quite as long as this sort of stuff, but um, the first tracking collars for elk, I think they were in about the 70s radio collars. So yeah, always always ch makes me chuckle the, the haircuts and the uh, equipment they were using back in the day. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and um, the technology the RSPB has used over the years um, and for what applications and also then I'll go into a little bit where where do I start so I mean I, I'm I've got a background in electronics but yeah I, I thought it'd be good to start at the bottom uh, on tools and bits and pieces that are important and just uh, knowledge that's just useful to look on the internet to get you underway and then because all our techs in remote places, of course, uh, power is always an issue. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, important bits, the finishing of the article, so sealing and weatherproofing and how to do that. And um, yeah, and just a little insight to say, I mean, a lot of this stuff, it needs a little bit of electronics background, but you can do a lot of this now. There's so much stuff out there that you can you can learn online and little tips and bits and pieces that you can steal and work with to produce a really good end product. So yeah, my, my main role is for the um, science department. So it's, yeah, it's conservation research. So I mean, yeah, this is ringing at the basic level. So where it all started. So um, on to lots of bling on this black tail godwit. So you can see on the legs there, we've got um, a geolocator and we've got a pit tag and then we just got some um, color rings. So people recite them. Uh, we can get records to where those birds are around the around the globe. So it's it's very much using technology to to gain insights in our on our species and yeah mainly birds in my case, but have worked on bits and pieces on livestock and mammals. And yeah, tracking is clearly a, a big part of it. So I've been quite involved with satellite tracking of turtle doves, uh, birding big declines, 90% declines since the 90s. So we've got. Uh, movements of a few birds that were this one bird actually it's Titan tracked down up and back a couple of times to its wintering grounds in Senegal and Mali but I also get involved quite a bit with persecution stuff so I work with our investigation department so it's protection covert equipment to find out uh, and hopefully prevent persecution and uh, put the persecutors to uh, to the sword if we actually get any evidence to uh, to find out what's happened. So it's a poor peregrine, it's met its demise here. And yeah, so, so where I started on that, yeah, installing cameras and things at nest sites, the peregrine nest there. And back in the day, 2002, I was using time-lapse video recorders, very, very power hungry. So you can see how it's moved on. This was an egg collector of stealing eggs at a chuff nest back in back in 2002. So yeah, my first major project really kicked me off into what um, things I really need to think about. So uh, my boss gave me the remit, this this bird on the top is a lapwing, Eurasian lapwing, and he wanted a nest camera there of dec big declines and we needed to know the causes of those declines. So it's looking at predators or yeah, whether the nests were trampled, whatever. Uh, and I came in with this really good idea, let's come up, oh yeah, all singing, all dancing was the way to go. Uh, and then it soon came down. I realised, cool, yeah, too many complications. So I had triggers, I had infrared beams, I had passives, and just triggering the system. And then you get spiders. Everything walks in front. Spiders like the heat of the camera and just in front of the lens or front of the triggers. Moss grows in front. It gets um, too too complicated at times. So yeah, I had to tone it down and I'd always start at the basic end and just look for what you need to know and target that and build your system around that. And then if you want to elaborate later, then you can do so. So yeah, we built our own camera. We had a recording box and battery 
so we could get it close to the nest and it was very, very small. So the birds weren't bothered uh, in this case. So lap wings were quite happy with this and then stone and a curler at the bottom there, quite happy with um, cameras close, but other situations didn't work. So yeah, some species weren't tolerant of a camera close. We need a different attachment. All those things need to be considered um, when you're building and even within species. So one lap wing, we'd put the camera straight in, it'd be happy with that equipment, even though you can see that's all above ground and that's all it can see. But in an open context, that uh, looks pretty big to them and they're quite bothered and we've had to introduce it at stages, starting a distance away and bringing it in closer. So within species, you need to consider. So a very important thing to work on is that no one size fits all and you need to design around something that will be multi-purpose. So yeah, there are new, new cameras in the top there, but the bottom is the new one we've had to move on due to obsolescence. And I'll have to talk about that a little bit as we go along. So it's met purpose. So we found out, yeah, just basic black and white camera. Most of the events were at night time. So infrared was perfect. And we found out whether the nest was successful or whether he has a foot of a sheep in the nest or whether there's a predator like a fox all those sort of things. We got the information we wanted. We didn't need high resolution. Higher resolution gave more power, which brought more problems for autonomy of the system. So just think simple, look what you want to learn and yeah, design at the base end of the minimum requirements. So yeah, I touched on that. So power key key issue. And for you biologists, I mean, I work with a lot of biologists and it's um a case of yet yeah, they don't know their milliamps from their volts or anything so buying a cheap multimeter from yeah wherever it might be five ten pounds is essential um and learning how to use it so just measuring your batteries so you can see that that meter's actually set on 20 there so if you've got a lead acid battery you can measure your voltage of the battery um and also um this function is very important. So if you've got leads and connections you need to test, then um, you can have uh, the continuity beeper and you can beep out your cables, beep out your fuses to determine whether there's a problem with your equipment and also always measure the current. So if I, if I buy something or build something myself, I always look at uh, specifications and normally they are always oversubscribed in current. So you might see 100 milliamps is the current that something uses, but you actually measure it now, it's only 50 milliamps. So if you can break your circuit and actually measure the current, you will know the duration, the autonomy of your system. So current voltage measurements and also continuity on a voltmeter are really important. So even if you're electronic uh, incompetent, just spend a bit of time looking online, speaking to people you know, using wild, wild labs, whatever, and get familiar with a voltmeter because it really is quite essential. So power, as I say, yeah, we're doing everything in remote, remote places. Uh, we don't have access to the, the national grid. We can't plug in. So batteries are an essential part of all of the kit we use. And this has really moved on quite considerably in my time from when I started with the mobile technology re revolution that you can get powers now. You see 100 milli 180 milliamp per hour, that lithium polymer battery on the power point there. Quite, yeah, it'd have been a lot, lot bigger for anything at that capacity. So it's really driven the, the technology world dramatically in the last 20 years. So yeah, there's power calculators. I'll put one on the, uh, as a link there. So if you, yeah, you've got your um, information of what you might use and um, it will help you determine your voltage and your current in terms of um, how long the system's going to run and what to actually go for. And sometimes we've had people uh, in remote places where maybe smaller field workers carrying quite heavy batteries. And so physical weight and dimensions are very, very important. You might have a, an hour or so walk in to install the kit. And if, if you've got something really heavy and it's on the back of a backpack, then lead acid batteries and things are a little bit of a, a problem. And we've also built collars where we've used technologies where batteries aren't quite suitable due to temperatures. So we've had 
uh, cow collars where we at one stage we used uh, nickel metal hydride and then we in, in the winter when the, the animals were about and we were down in the realms of minus tens those batteries didn't perform the way we might have hoped and gave us nowhere near the capacity so always look at the technology for the batteries that you might be using and just some tips that yeah things that I've come across and learned I mean yeah, lithium polymer that I showed you there a lot of the drones and things will use lithium polymer but they're very very volatile so be very careful with them we always have uh, bags to carry them so we make our own flammable cases when we're transporting them around and I've, I've seen them go off and they go puffy so yeah be very very careful with lithium polymer lithium iron is much safer so if I've got choice I uh, I use that technology rather than lithium polymer but lithium polymer is generally a bit cheaper so yeah that would be a, a trade-off for you and yeah batteries yeah, I've seen it for myself. I was in Senegal with um, a cheap battery uh, that was powering one of our remote camcorders and it um, it was in the back seat of the car and just um, combusted on the back seat. Unfortunately, my colleague had a hat and put it out, otherwise the vehicle would have gone up. So do be very careful in what you buy because some of these things, yeah, it was a cheap uh, Sony requisite that uh, went up. So do consider that, that sometimes you cost savings can be uh, at uh, a risk to you. And so, yeah, this battery here I've used in recent times where I've needed big capacity in remote places. So uh, lead acids of similar size are about double the weight. So these are very expensive. They cost about 150 pounds, but then you've got the, the fact that you can carry more of them. And they're, yeah, they're a lot safer than a lead acid. Uh, yeah, the lithium iron phosphate battery. So I've been using those when we needed remote power of capacities of 40 ampere hours in, in remote places. And yes, yeah, supply. If you, yeah, you don't have the right voltage that you need. If you're building something, say, yeah, if you've got a, a bit of equipment, you're just buying something off the shelf that you want that needs to run off five volts. Yeah, look for little regulators like this. So we've used these quite a bit and you can just use them on the, the front end there that will convert 12 volts to five volts and, and you'll put them, there's not much quiescent, so wasted power, wa wasted current in there, about four milliamps. And you can, yeah, you can power some of your five volt if, you, if you're adapting consumer equipment and then put those in. So we, yeah, we've used them quite a bit in recent times. And if you do use things and you're making front end stuff, with batteries always make sure you put a primary fuse in because it's imperative if you're relying on um yeah damp all these things that come in in remote places make sure you fuse everything and i've not used a lot of it because we're working on species that are endangered or uh, in the uk or abroad that are the threat very near threatened and yeah, uh, a solar panel near the site would cause a problem in terms of maybe people just detecting the nest or interfering. So we haven't used a lot of um, solar power on many projects because of that. And also solar, solar panels are very interesting to, to the thief. People know exactly what they're for, a bit of conservation tech that's subtly in a gray box they might leave, but a solar panel might be something that would be desirable so I've not used them but I know there's situations a lot of projects do use them but yeah this is a, a website I've I've seen and I've used it odd times just to put in it's very much based on the UK and I'm sure there's um, other things available uh, for um, you could yeah you could look up the comparisons between the UK and where you are on a, a daily basis but it, it just gives you an idea of what sort of panel depending on what sort of equipment you've got and yeah I found it very useful just as a a port of call for some of my biologists who um, need to um, power something on a seabird cliff, for example. And yeah, if you do build your own equipment, uh, how do I house it? What's an IP rating? So you might see this sort of information on a on a website, and it's very much about how much ingress of a liquid or a dust or dust is the first digit there, uh, that you get in your equipment if you leave it out. So boxes, enclosures will all have a rating and, and a lot of your suppliers, if you're buying 
off the shelf equipment will have a, a rating and and most cases the first digit would be a six and ip60 something would be what you're looking at not allowing dust in and yeah 66 or above depending where yeah whether you're immersing your kit in water but um the key the key to all of this really is if you do uh, get some equipment so there's that case uh instrument case in the bottom there They're, they all have a gasket and that gasket will fatigue over time if you don't look after it so if you uh regularly unscrewing and screwing that will wear out but you just need to check that there's no debris in there because a force um a little groove in there will will just cause all the problems and you'll you'll get liquid into your instrumentation and Another thing I use a lot is self amalgamating tape. So we've got an array of uh, mini speakers there that we'd have had on a, a remote island to try and bring seabirds back. So they'd be like their own hi-fi system in each burrow. And I use a lot of self amalgamating tape because if you have a problem, you do a you 50% overlap with self amalgamating tape and that cr creates a really good seal. But if you then have problems, yeah, it's a really easy way of going in in without cutters and you have no residue gaffer tape and there's a real awful mess where self amalgamating tape is brilliant and you can easily open it up if you have a problem so i recommend self amalgamating tape and yes my i think it's a spellsberg or five box their box about 10 pound or something uh ip67 they do the job and other good means of protecting your equipment so I know a lot of the radio tag manufacturers use it, Plasti Dip, but I use a lot of Plasti Dip for, in addition to self amalgamating tape for securing uh, equipment and also connections. It's it's just a liquid um, sealant that even if you dab it on, <laughs> dab it all over, it really looks nice afterwards. So yeah, however lousy you think you put your coat on it really has a nice finish. And once again, like self amalgamating tape, it really is easy to pick off if you need to go back in if you have a problem. And where weight is concerned, if you can't afford an enclosure through, uh, in my case, a lot of it goes on birds and weights imperative that we yeah, have two and a half, three percent of body weight we're working on. So we do enclose in heat shrink tubing which is um, with applying of um, like a heat gun, you can use hot air guns from paint stripping, something like that, and it will shrink to two to one ratio generally. Uh, and we've used it quite a lot for seabirds where we've needed uh, to reduce and keep the weight down, whereas we, yeah, we want a tag on the back and it's just a nice short term uh, deployment accessory and yeah cables cables important uh, i use a lot of braided sheaths so, i mean that's it's generally about a pound a meter some of that sort of stuff so where mammal chewing's an issue we you know, put that over the top over cables and we use the camo tape as well another important thing i would say with cables so if you can't afford or yet yeah, the sheath in is a problem for you and you, you don't really want to go up that route i would recommend that you always weather your cables so mammals really do take a, an interest in that artificial smell so when stuff's new they'll go after it and we have new cables tend to get chewed a lot lot more than old weathered cables so we often put it in a barn near all the manure and weather it and and the chances of mammals chewing it are reduced and yeah if you've got it um sheathed as well it gives you a bit more protection if somebody wants to tamper and cut through your cables so yeah we've had some uh locals at sites where they've not wanted us to go with the project so they've yeah, cut through our cables so yeah if you've got it a, a little bit armored then it gives you that extra protection and camo yeah means that people don't see it so much and yes all of this stuff adds a little bit of um, corrosion protection to what you've done and another tip I would go along those lines is probably when we've had long cable runs, we've we broke it up. So we'll dig it in and then have it above ground and dig it in. If it's a long stretch, say tens of metres, we, we do that because we found like mustelids and things will follow a cable run, the scent and a linear feature. So do break up your your cable in uh, if you if you are doing that sort of thing. Yeah. So going on to the more the 
probably the interesting stuff for some of you, the um, the tech that I've used. So yeah, do bear in mind that um, any equipment can be manipulated. And yeah, I rarely throw anything out. My budgets are quite limited. So things like um, old mobile phones will do a lot of good. So we had, in this case, this was a doctored mobile phone it, for site protection. So we could have an alert, a phone call to the, the nearest um, protection staff in the vicinity of a, of a rare breeding bird nest. We've also used them for like trap alerts. So if we've been baiting a trap to try and catch a species to tag, we'd have a, a phone call or something to say that we've, or text message to say the tracks at, the trap is active, go and get your bird. So your mobile phones and things with a little bit of jiggery popery can be adapted to conservation purpose and yeah, livestock collars there. So we've used the basis of a mobile phone with some batteries and uh, and a collar and, and done livestock tracking for grazing to see whether they creep off our reserve or uh, there's welfare, welfare concerns. So we yeah, we do livestock tracking for grazing and all sorts of things. So it's, it's not just birds that we work on. And yeah, a bit of imagination. So rock wall, this is one of my early projects. It was a fire timer and we were doing sites. We were, we were burning uh, and we needed to know the temperature at the root stop wasn't exceeded. So I had a, a triggered timer in there with uh, a few components and a, a pedigree chum tin and a bit of rock wall and it worked a treat. So just a bit of imagination. These things don't have to cost a lot of money. And this, yeah, this was one of the best uh, projects that we've ever had in terms of uh, volume. So it was an I got you logger. I'm sure quite a few of you are aware of that one, but I I can't remember when I found it. But yeah, we brought those and we ended up paying about twenty pounds, twenty five dollars or so for for those. And we stripped them down out of the housing. Uh, some cases we changed batteries. Uh, some cases we put uh, sensors on to trigger it to turn it on and off. But a bit of heat shrink sleeve in to keep the weight down and then. Uh, you'll see at the end a little bit um, crimped so we'd use a, a vice edge to nip at both ends so that we didn't get ingress of water so what single layer for seabirds and those other ones are a named one for my daughter but you can see the ends aren't second ed isn't sealed but that was for penguins and we would double layer those because they were going down to 50 and 100 meters so the same bit of tech um, became a gps logger and you'll see a couple on kitty weight backs there and we, we deployed about a thousand we got about a thousand traces and at 20 pound a time it made our um, wind farm and seabird iba work very very important we got such a extent of data that we wouldn't have got with any off the shelf tagging technology the work we've done has involved a lot of pick processors so yeah just basic 8-bit or 16-bit picks and we've used things like mp3 players and and yeah built that for me this is probably my most direct conservation impact project i've been enrolled with so yeah the mp3 player an amplifier a pick turning it on and off with a timer and yeah we put this on uh remote places so here with a solar panel uh with a backup battery the horn speaker some decoy puffins and you bring those seabirds back when you've had an eradication you get rid of the the rats the mice whatever it may be you put your cooler on and the birds come back and start breeding so you it's really a big one for me that i'm having direct conservation impact for yeah the whole setup probably with solar panels cost 50 pounds so um for me probably one of my best bits of work for for impact and then unfortunately yeah audio mothers superseded this but yeah before um uh, that came along we were we were kind of doctoring um with another pick again in this case a dictaphone from olympus for about 30 pound a house in so we you know built our own and built our own microphones uh automatic sound recording for about 60 pounds and yeah this one so a key fod camera that was available on the internet with uh few components became our onboard flight recorder for a gannet. We had a GPS on there. We used the key fob. We switched it on, on and off for periods of time because a lot of our stuff, GPS, we knew where the birds were, but we wanted to know what they were doing and what they're interacting with. 
So I'm going to hopefully see whether this will. Oh, it didn't run. Um, I'll maybe do it afterwards. So, yeah, um, we got some um, behavior of a flight uh, following other gannets, whether they're following fishing boats, all that sort of stuff was was gleaned from these tags, unfortunately, because of the, the power and resolution required of transmitting. We we went with the recatch and fortunately the, the birds come back to the island. So, yeah, we put half a dozen tags on and we got three back. So, um, yeah, that was another one with just a bit of um, imagination that for a 20 pound key fob camera, we got some really good data. Away from the pic, uh, pics that uh, microprocessors, we've done a lot with those, but yeah, just for you that you yeah, think, oh, crumbs, so what are they talking about pick processors? I mean, yeah, lots of stuff. You, I'm sure you've all heard of Arduino, lots of things with um, just addition of a chip or two and a bit of pinching a code. So, yeah, we built pit tag readers. I think on Steph's introduction slide there, we had um, uh, weigh-in systems. We were, um, we've got birds that we're taking into captivity on eradication and we want to see when they go on a perch whether they're gaining or losing weight so we did a a, um, a weight measuring perch strain gauge type system and this one's yeah pit tag reader with just an arduino and just a little bit of knowledge of and help from people on there's loads of people happily help you online um that are really into this sort of stuff and you can find bits and pieces of code knit it together and if you can just iron out that syntax you can buy you can build yourself a pip tag reader in this case it's actually a pip tag logger so we're logging when the the birds in in and out and back at a nest and raspberry pi another another means um that um in more recent times the the kind of more um uh biologist or um non electronic qualified person can work with and there, there's so much out there i mean this is the yeah, raspberry pi motors type setup with a gps hat on the top we've got the the regulator in on board there so you can run it from a 12 volt battery and yeah i've added a few other bits and pieces of timer and views so we can turn it on and off uh, remotely um but yeah these sort of things are very much out there and the, the kind of world is your oyster really because things have really come along uh, so that a lot more stuff can be done in the, the amateur domain. So, yeah, so I've done a bit of drone stuff and I'm just using that really to say that, yeah, think, think outside the box. Don't think that you just need to buy something with one project in mind. So we, we brought our uh, UAV or drone frame back in 2012 we still got the same one still using it and it was just a flexible one we assembled ourselves with a bit of soldering and we added because the budgets were tight we added bits and pieces to it year on year and our first thought was finding nests so we got a montague's harrier nest in the middle of a reed bed we don't want to go crashing through the reed bed with boats uh, and a much less disturbance is caused by flying over the top top and checking the state of the nest before they go in and potentially ring or put other um, electronic devices on it but we went to a um, another option so so this is a stone curlew nest with a couple of eggs on the ground very cryptic you probably wouldn't see them otherwise but um, we put a thermal imager on board back in 2013 2014 and those those eggs are a real kind of beacon on the ground all that heat even though the bird had been on off a little while and it's middle of the day since it's 13 30 these sort of things can be used and the flexibility allowed us to do that so yeah i think you need to think about when you build something just don't think about one project think of the what it might lead you to and then the investment and this sort of stuff becomes a bit more worthwhile and just just to finish off so we've been working yeah our projects when i first came i mean our nest camera's just gone obsolete and it it was around for about 10 years but a lot of a lot of these other things so the the mp3s that we we built around have gone obsolete and they've gone a lot more involved and a lot more circuitry that you've got to build around um so yeah design assuming a shelf life of five years is what we do and, and things move on pretty rapidly and you'll find something else comes along like the audio moth and make sure you get enough of everything to make it worthwhile so there's no point we 
we built that um, pit tag reader and we got half a dozen of, of the chips. And unfortunately, by the next year, somebody said, oh, that's great. We like that. Can we have some more? So well, unfortunately, that's gone. So we're going to have to rewrite the code and get the new front end chip to, to do so. So do think about that because things move pretty, pretty rapidly in, in tech terms. And I mean, yeah, we do build completely from scratch, but I'm just going to, yeah, I thought this talk would give you an insight that lots of things are out there. If you just happen to look in the right places and talk to the right people, then you can find things that can be easily adapted to, to do what you want rather than paying thousands and two thousands of pounds for tags, as an example, then you, you might find something that can do it for less than a hundred pounds. So I think that's about it. Um, hopefully that's opened up a few uh, ideas for discussion and um, I'll open to questions and hopefully I'll maybe go outside and, and run that Gannett clip while we're um, um, putting some questions through because it didn't run through the um, through the teams unfortunately. Thank you. Sorry <laughs> I was getting distracted by the, um, the questions. Um, one, that was awesome, Nigel. That was just such a, um, uh, just a tour through so many things that you've built for RSPB. Um, so thank you. Um, we do have some questions. Um, oh, Rob, that was terrible. Um, okay, Andrew, you're, for, <laughs> Andrew, you're first up. Do you want to jump in? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so it, just in terms of building things which there's a risk of other animals eating them are there any tips in terms of how to encase them do we want it to sort of pass straight through or you know be regurgitated or is there any sort of tips you've got in terms of worrying about predation of of your sensors uh that's a good question i mean we've yeah i don't know where you're where you're you're coming from where where do you live or work uh i'm in the uh, Oldham area, actually. Oh, right. Oh, UK. Right. OK. Um, I mean, some of our munching has been livestock. So, yeah, cows will go by and yes, yeah, certainly young sort of heifers and things on, on a plot will cause a problem. They're very inquisitive and we'll we'll get their um, molars through cables. So, yeah, we do, if we can try and, yeah, if we can't upset the substrate and make things too obvious, we will kind of try and channel as much as we can underground and put, and put it under underneath um yeah i mean it's very much about sm smells really as i mentioned earlier if the uh thing smells artificial so i i know bbc on spring watch on some of their cable runs and things when they, they've got miles and miles over their site of, of cables and they're all quite fresh in I've, I've talked to them about it and they said oh yeah well we've come across that that um, yeah. rodents rats and things will we'll pick up on that oh, i'll have a little try of that is any good and we'll have a little bite. Oh, I don't fancy that. I might even get a shock, which will put them off in future. But um, um, I haven't really got anything other than just trying to make it smell like the environment it's in, really. I think I was meaning in terms of if you attach it to a tag on a bird and then the bird gets predated. Yeah, are there issues that way? Uh, oh, God, God. I mean, we've we've done a lot of raptor stuff and um, we have most of these things we do retrieve quite a lot of tags so yeah it might be radio tra transmitters and owls and things i mean if it's depending how it's stuck to the back um we use sometimes it might be tape sometimes it's glues and these things will get pulled off so we've had owls and things we know they're an owls or buzzards we find them near the nest and they're often on the ground nearby and we're actually electronically depending on what sort of device it is been able to hone in and actually find that tag on the ground and we've not really got enormous amount of evidence of, that things have munched them and we'll often find rings and, and lots of things the metallic parts will actually sit in the nest and we'll we might go to that raptor for example and yeah get root through it to see what it's been eating and we'll, we'll end up with a lot of the telemetry perhaps left in that nest but um, in terms of mammals i mean we don't really know so much so we've had foxes we'll have we've had transmitters disappear and they go underground and unfortunately we don't hear from them again and so you never really know whether they've ingested them or whether they've just sat yeah 10 meters underground in the badger set or the fox earth or or whatever so um i don't know what that answers your question but um 
yeah, the, the, the experience that I've had um, are very, very much UK in, in terms of the volumes we've done. Um, and yeah, I've never known of anything kind of been post-mortems we found anything inside, but it is, it is possible. Uh, Tara, do you want to jump in? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, it's not too noisy. Yay. Hi, this is Tara from Vancouver, BC, where it is oh, sunny my. today. Um, nice. My back, thank you. This was awesome. I enjoyed this so much and learned so much. Um, I'm more familiar with environmental monitoring, not conservation, although I love mm. conservation technology and that is why I'm here today. Yeah. Um, I think I'm just really curious about sort of more on the standard side of things because I, you know, as much as I love DIY and hacking, how do you trust, you know, these bits and bobs that you pick up yeah, to that's, that's put the stuff together and trust the data that you get out of it and, you know, all that good stuff. And I'm just wondering if there's, you know, a standardized list you can look at or you get it reviewed in a certain way or mm. what that I mean, looks like. I mean, yeah, that's that's a very good point I should have mentioned. So, I mean, I had colleagues went to, um, they got a friend who he said, oh, he does something or that our, our camera equipment for uh, nest site protection, oh, it's a bit old hat, we need to be moving it on. I've got a friend. So he went to a friend and they, they went home and they all came into me. Oh, Nigel, it's, it's brilliant. It does everything. Oh, wow, fantastic. Oh, great. Uh, so uh, first question I got for you, what power does it use? And he says, um, oh, we didn't ask that. I said, oh, crumbs, that's not good. And uh, and anyway, came back to me the next time I've asked him. I said, oh, it's one and a half amps. He said, so, you know, that's 36 amp hour hours a day. I said, well, yeah, where are we going to find that? We don't want people to see where the, the nest is because we're trying to protect. We can't put solar panels in. Oh, no. So, yeah, you, you have to be a bit careful. And probably why I'm employed by RSPB, I save a bit of money because you can easily go out and get something that's not suitable for purpose. And you get you spend all this money and you get something in and then power in, in that case an issue. But, yeah, your um, your case, I, I'm actually doing something with um, one of our reserve staff at the moment. They're doing lots of salinity measurements and water level on a reserve. So I've been helping them uh, decide which sensors to go to and yeah, which um, which medias, whether we use a GSM to, to offload that data remotely. And I've kind of yeah been involved and, and given a lot of advice and hopefully we spent the right money on that. But yeah, you can easily get um, bamboozled into an idea that you think that somebody tells you is great, you can spend a lot of money on it, and it doesn't do the job. So I think um, it's kind of yeah getting people you trust to give you good advice and um, um, yeah, Wild Labs is a media for that. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know what tech support you've got in your organisation, but um, yeah, just use what you've got, really. I would say. I would just add, yeah, I would just add that Wild Labs. I mean, Nigel, Alistair, Rob, a lot of people in this chat are the people I ask if for that sort of advice. I don't think there are clear standards, are there? Are there, Nigel? That you can no, I mean, in terms of, um, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, it depends what side you're looking at. I mean, in terms of, um, yeah, weatherproofing, you need to get the right things. There, There is, um, um, if, if you're transmitting stuff, there's regulatory stuff with, yeah, with that sort of thing. So Ofcom and um, uh, uh, regulations to, if you build your own stuff, then you've got uh, regulations with um, uh, electromagnetic interference, things like that. So yeah, I'm not sure what yeah what parameters you're interested in, then, Tara. Are you? Um, I mean, I think it was you know, for example, let's say you're doing sound recording, right? Uh -huh. I mean, obviously that's going yeah. to be very different depending on what kinds of devices you're using, and you can obviously spend a lot of money on that, and mm -hmm. um, you know, there's quality differences, I suppose. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah. I guess that's where I was most curious okay. as to how do you ensure the quality is okay for um, the work that you're doing. Uh, yes, I mean, w yeah, our sound stuff we started quite a long time ago, and it, it's very much, yeah, led by peer review papers, and, and we followed a, a regime that we we had a recorder. I, yeah, I built um, our, yeah, we used a little electric 
uh, microphones on that, which are probably similar similar to like the, the commercial song meter came along. Uh, it was a, similar to that, and we and we worked. I think somebody worked on a, a sampling rate of one minute every ten or something. You switch your recorder on and take one minute ten in ten snapshot, and 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 you'd work to that. And provided your uh, experiment ran through using the, exactly the same criteria, I was sort of quite happy with it. We didn't we used the same sort of equipment through the two or three years of the project, and and that gave us a standard, and we worked with that. Hey Rob, do you want to jump in now? And I mean, feel free to add a comment to this because you've been dropping this discussion, but also take away for your questions. Hi Nigel, that was excellent. Hi, um, um, I ha I just had two very quick questions because I reckon everybody here would probably be interested in following up some of this. One was, do you post your projects or any of your projects to places like GitHub or somewhere like that? Well, yeah, it's a bit, a bit of a kind of interesting one. So, yeah, my um, conservation director did, we did talk about it and, yeah, should we be going a lot more open source? And I, I have promised on occasions when I've been feeling a bit under the weather or something that to Steph that I'd give her one or two um of our, our designs and and setups, and I'm quite happy to give some some of those tips. I mean, yes, I can give you websites for some of those things I've I've come across before, but um, we've not done much. The the problem is, so my department are very much for uh, getting things scientifically reviewed in, in peer reviewed journals, and and my attitude to that is all well and good, but the system takes perhaps two years to actually get stuff out there, and things I said talked to you about obsolescence, a big problem, and I, I'm quite keen that. If yeah, I'm quite happy to give a few circuit diagrams and things away, and this is what you need to solder here, and this is where you need to solder there, and do that. It's the yeah, it's the fact that my department very much is is focused on on uh, scientific literature that and and when I talk to about it to our my director, he, he talked to oh should we patent this sort of stuff, and I I, I said no, we don't really do that. It's it's too complicated. So yeah, I'm quite happy to give some advice and when at the moment I'm working on my own, my, my colleagues furloughed, so I've only got one pair of hands and eyes. I'm quite happy to bit 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 more on there, but uh, on Wild Labs or wherever um, to, to give some of the tips away before they go, um, before they get replaced by something else like the Audio Moth, for example, and um, it's no use to anybody. Okay. Yeah, so um, Ellie and Steph, you know they they they're never very busy. So I reckon one thing you've suggested there is Wild Labs to have a peer-reviewed journal on tech stuff. Ooh. How awesome would that be? But okay. I, I like I like your I like your enthusiasm about the scientific stuff um, and peer review. We try and do the same thing, but we also try and simultaneously release stuff to open source through yeah. the the journal. Okay. So my second question is a bit more of a tech one. Have you ever tried or have been successful at building your own geolocators? The, you showed one on the, was it a Godwit at the beginning? that you Yeah, had Blacktail that Godwit. Yeah, so I'm just you know, finishing off on the, yeah, so I have always thinking of like, uh, journal, just finishing your first question, journal of field ornithology, I've sent well, odd papers of ours have gone into and, and think of their short notes rather than, you yeah, know, just get them in the back and they don't need so much of a review process. So I was thinking of getting one or two things into that over this autumn, winter. So watch this space on that one. And the, the second one, yeah, uh, geolocator is very, very simple because it's basically a light sensor and a microprocessor logging that light. The clever stuff is the software to actually give you a location of that bird. So you, yeah, I'm not really a big software writer. So once you get those numbers out, then you've got to extract that to give you the day length and the, the high noon to work out where it is. And, and that sort of side of things really made me reach away. I, di I didn't fancy that. So um, yeah, if you've got somebody who likes a, a software challenge and yeah wants to go on board we yeah we could easily do that because the actual geolocator itself is there's nothing to it there's hand, there's a bit of power management uh, circuitry in there and a microprocessor just logging effectively a lux level a light level so it's very easy it's all the clever stuff is done by the processing afterwards when you get that geolocator back okay okay thanks nigel no problem um, next question is from Ned, who doesn't have a microphone. Um, how do you seal the ends of the heat shrink 
tubing on the GPS loggers to make them waterproof. Good point. I, I nearly I tried to find a picture of that. So we um, had some like mole grips that we welded to, if you can imagine, two flat surfaces to the end. So if you're remote and out in the field, we we would take a uh, uh, gas soldering iron and, and um, heat the heat shrink. And then we'd straight away, while it's still hot, that we'd nip together between those um, two surfaces of, uh, you can imagine it, I can send you a picture if you want. And then if I was in the office or somewhere close to, if I was in a bird observatory or something like that and had access to a vice, it's, you use the kind of end, end of the vice, nip it in the vice while it's hot and you get that lovely, um, almost like knurled effect. And, and it also it cre creates a, a better seal for me if you've got that that vice grip rather than two flat surfaces, you get lots of kind of knitted uh, points and it, it worked really well. As I say, we didn't find many of our rock hopper penguins with a double uh, layer of heat shrink. We found odd ones, let a little bit of water in, but the majority of them were all well and good after a, a week or so down in the depths. Ned, shout if that didn't answer your question fully. Okay, Rob's chiming in as well. Um, Andrew, had a question, also no mic. Um, do you, ha, Nigel, have you done any work with thermal cameras? He's looking for um, suggestions of affordable ones. Um, uh, they're looking uh, yeah, at I mean, yeah. lapwing and sky, sky lap nests. I mean, yeah, the the problem is, so we've we've done a bit of nest finding with a thermal imager, so that image was from the drone. Yes. And I used, I mean, it's very much the, finding the thing at the right time really it, it was an end of line I got in touch with the chap and they were uh, replacing their model so I got a thermotechnics which are quite close to me just the edge of Cambridge and I went there and he'd got an X demo and I can't remember what I paid for it but about a couple of thousand pounds but it, it weighed uh, less than the GoPro camera that you're putting on board so I mean just thought wow this is brilliant and we started flying and we found uh, corn crates flying around as yeah it's all about seeing through cover so if, you, if your nest's visible and you haven't got vegetation there and, and you pick the right time of day when the temperature differential is better you'll you'll see what you need to see basically so we tried bitterns for example in a reed bed and you've got a lot of reeds over the top and the heat of the reeds so it didn't work so well for those but if you've got a clear view from above or the side then thermal imaging definitely helps you to find nests and probably reduces overall the disturbance through uh, the risk of trampling so that stone curler was a classic one how cryptic is that egg uh, you could easily walk over that nest so if you can find it with with a electronic media then well all well and good um i'll just add that i not sure if this falls in the affordable bracket but FLIR does have a conservation discount program um as well and also sean from FLIR is in wild labs um we'll find the link yeah oh loveliest man um uh so he's really happy to he's been working with wwf um on a lot of their FLIR work so he's always happy to answer questions around um deploying their stuff as well um yeah yeah FLIR um, stuff FLIR stuff is brilliant i can't argue with the quality of their equipment it's brilliant it's just uh, it might just be the cost uh yeah <laughs> So, um, and uh, Al also dropped in a link as a suggestion to the Lepton 3.5. Um, uh, okay, Jared. Uh, Jared, did you? No, no, Mike. Okay, Jared was wondering, and we get this question a lot um, around people from the tech, from a tech background, how they move into this as a career. So he was wondering what sort of job titles um, do people have what, what job titles have you heard and what's the best way to find jobs um Rams, yeah. to find to combine tech and maker skills with conversation yeah. i mean yeah that's a spot on question because i i was it was yeah 2000 i used to work at um cambridge university at a chemical engineering department so i was doing much bigger scale sensory type high power equipment yeah. stuff and i was getting a little bit fed up with it and i thought if i don't find something i really got a passion about i'm out of here and i, I was going to quit the electronics and it was the cambridge even news the local paper amongst the like spec savers I, I put it in some of my presentations actually i should have done so there's a mcdonald's advert a spec savers and there's this rspb one that had um at the time my job title was technical development officer and i thought it's an officer job what's that mean and i just saw a little bullet point among the text background electronics of wow i'm gonna have to go for this and 
as where where we are now. So and it's changed to senior technical officer. But RSPB were very forward thinking, and there was somebody did my role back in the 90s, and he left, and I took it. But I don't think many other conservation organisations have a a conservation wing, and you, you'd probably be better looking for maybe a university or something like that. I know. Um, uh, WWT have got some sort of volunteer people that are techie and doing it in the background. The yeah, BTO I haven't got anybody, but it's um, yeah. I think if you if you can find a link with a university that will link in, you find a project. So I think yeah, I think the BTO did a project with UEA to try a GSM tag and linking that together. So you could you could kind of knit this sort of thing. If you get a university role, you can knit the conservation and um, technology together. But there aren't many jobs in in the sphere unfortunately al since a lot a lot of people are asking this question do you want to jump in with a comment uh yeah can you hear me yep yeah i mean i get asked this all the time because i've done like what 15 years of of this and you often find that when you're going for a, a job the hr departments will do what you say nigel and i'll get they'll get a little bit funny around any kind of terms such as conservation technologist or anything which isn't doesn't doesn't stick so they'll probably like just silo you to technical specialist or as you yeah. said like you know yeah. technical engineer and then you'll find that even though you're working specifically on quite bespoke conservation work in the field they'll just put you in HR as that um you can kind of make up your own titles like Shah from Conservify will always call himself a conservation technologist um because he can do that because you know he, he's pushing his own agenda there and that works. I think it's it's a term that over the last few years is becoming more known now because yeah. this world has evolved so much over like the past, you know, five, yeah. ten years mm -hmm. that you can go out there and say you do that and people get what you do. Um, so I think it's in a, an evolving space. I, just to add in a comment, I think it's changing a lot in the last few years, at least from a co conservation NGO perspective, like there's a greater recognition of the need for actual advice um uh, i think technical specialist is probably the, the job title but i do know like a lot of the big ngos will have someone like you nigel or like eric becker or like you al like um nice we get some uh women engineers in there but you know <laughs> so, yeah. baby steps guys um but i think and like i know like in australia the same thing they have um the roles are getting there it's just it's a it's conservation tech as a as a profession and a, an ecosystem is changing a lot in, in over the, the past few years and you've been in it a while you must notice that mm. or are you just very uh, RSPB inward uh well yeah probably have been I, I think yeah the wild labs give you a bit of a um big up I think it's really connecting me so I'm, yeah aware of Alistair of course and, and and I've kind of contacted a few more people via that way rather than be very insular but yeah there's yeah. For, for 10 years I worked at RSPB on my own so I could only had one pair of hands and I couldn't really think of everybody else I I had so many people to serve in terms of yeah have mentioned the investigations the research but also yeah reserves all these sort of things use equipment and they'll often say oh what do you think we should be is this the right way to go is this are we wasting our money so I was getting involved with so much of that and now I've got a bit more in the team I've been able to kind of look out a little bit and I don't look in at wild labs and things as much as I should but because there's only a certain amount of hours in the day and yeah um it's um okay uh next question was from Sarah do you want to jump in oh hi yeah I'm Sarah from Melbourne here hello everyone um hi. hi I was just wondering if you had anything to say about testing equipment either before it goes out or for evaluating alternative solutions or for um, I guess kind of that quality assurance piece as well yeah yeah good point so yeah, maybe another thing I should have mentioned so when 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 I see something so I mean I mentioned we do start from scratch and do make things from, from the bottom level but if you can start with something that's already out there and adapt it's great and um, and sometimes there'll be maybe two or three models or something you think oh this is all right They're, and and you'll kind of trade off one's got something that the other one hasn't got and oh yeah I like that and, and we'll maybe buy if it's sort of 20 or 50 quid we'll, we'll buy them all and put them side by side and there's yeah, there's always going to be, oh, that one's got two bits better than that, but that's much better with that one. So we'll we'll have a play with it, invest with it, 
and and measure the currents and all the things that are important to us so yeah clearly the power is one of the most important and, and often when we're fitting transmitters weight is massive so we yeah even when we brought telemetry from manufacturers sometimes we get we don't get exactly what they told us so yeah it's very important to check out everything for all the things that are important to you all the criteria always kind of measure them because um yeah you don't always get as i mentioned in the talk a little bit you don't always get what you're expecting so definitely do that definitely check out everything and maybe just yeah ask for a prototype get that first one and have a look at it and if it don't invest go heavy if that if you know the company or um individual well enough to say come on i want to have a look at your prototype with um yeah we, we've done that in the past you yeah, got involved with projects and and had a prototype and and checked it over and even if it's they're not sure and they're not quite ready we've had sort of dummies of, of certain things just how it's engineered how it's going to fit so sometimes to so say that the species uh, how it sits on the back if it's if it's a telemetry um it's a tag of some sort that's going to sit on the back of a bird we need to see how it's going to be attached and all that before so sometimes they'll give you a, a dummy prototype without the electronics in with how, how they think it's going to weigh and how it's going to look and and make sure you get it before you go because yeah you can waste a lot of money and time if you get the wrong thing and it's not what they promised you right yeah i love that idea of using a dummy some dummy equipment or just the housing maybe to, to begin with brilliant yeah thanks great talk okay. thank you one one last question sean do you have a do you have a mic or was that was that question? yes i do sorry jump in um, I, was, I was just wondering if you've got any experience of using lora or qrp for sending data back from remote sites yeah, I've just started to get involved a little bit with LoRa. I mean, it's um, it's another um, new one. Yeah, we've done um, uh, other technologies, but yeah, I know um, yeah, people are getting quite keen on LoRa, and we've got a, a project in the Cairngorms where um, other telemetry might be quite expensive, and we're talking about yeah, deploying on a lot of um, mammals that so might be deer and livestock and want to see their movements and if we can do sort of short range of collars to a to a um a low ra transmitter collecting that data and then forward it on because it's yeah it's very remote in the hills there so we are looking into it and uh, a little bit and you're yeah, quite keen that um things yeah move on with low ra maybe on on camera traps and things like that as well so yeah I've, I've not personally done much with it yet but um it's something that um a lot of people are looking at and yeah we we've clearly got it in the in the background there to to see what we make of it as a technology and you know, whether it's going to be good for one or two projects we've got lined up okay uh, Sean, what was the reason for your question uh, I, a couple of talks ago i'm actually uh working on a a, a monitoring project for uh triangulating bitterns by using their uh, uh their calls using a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino together yeah. to actually triangulate them in the beds and actually be able to map them in real time in 3D. Um, uh, and I'm just uh, struggling with uh, getting LoRa to do exactly what I need it to do. It's, it's, either, um, it's either not giving me the distance, which is why I was asking about QRP, because obviously the packets I'm wanting to send are really small. Yeah. So I can send them a long way using low power, yeah. um, but it's just that low uh, uh, the the antennas are not as low power as they you know as the manufacturers would have you believe. Yeah, exactly. And even using uh, an ESP32 in low power mode, I'm still eating through battery a lot quicker than I would like to. Mm. Um, and my, I'm looking at in order to maintain a, a low RAR solution that I'm going to have to go down the solar panel uh, route. And if I do that, then that's literally talking about a solar panel for each individual triangulation station, which is just going to light it up like a Christmas tree for everybody who wants to come and steal it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm struggling a bit on, hence why I'm thinking of maybe even dropping down to something like QRP, which literally takes you know, 20 minutes to send a bit of data but it uses literally no power and i can get you know three or four years worth of battery off of you know um 
an 18650 or two 18650s or something yeah. like that. So, yeah, so it's just difficult. So where are you doing your work then? Uh, with um, um, Gillian Gilbert. In oh, right. Edinburgh, okay. Good friend of mine. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're looking at doing uh, uh, a couple of RSPB sites up here. But we're also going to go out and do some of the corn crate sites out on Tyree okay, and yeah. one up on Harris uh, to just use the same thing. Because, of course, I've got the same, I mean, it's down in the same frequency range so that I can capture them and I can identify, I can literally use a very low noise floor to rip out all of the other sounds so yeah. I can do the, yeah. the thing. Because eventually what we're actually looking to do is actually tag individual, capture, capture enough information to actually be able to individually tag the bird, the, yeah. the, the male of the male species. So we can actually say that's host one, host two, rather than a bittern. So yeah. we're actually that's looking right. to actually identify specific bitterns by their calls. Yeah, so yeah, I was, I was around, I just started at early days at RSPB with Gillian was doing a lot of stuff at Minsmere on on bitterns and um, yeah, I think she, I think she maybe indirectly mentioned in some correspondence that she got somebody giving her a bit of hand in the background. So well done yes, for that. That's me. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm a cyber person, so it's just I monitor IoT devices and stuff. Yeah. So that's how I got involved. So okay. yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap the actual session, but if like there are lots of ideas coming in the chat so i mean feel free to hang around sean um and we can yep. brainstorm uh because i don't know this is probably the place to, to solve your question but for everyone else we're gonna we're gonna wrap the session uh there thank you so much nigel for that that was that was awesome very much appreciate you taking the time um and uh for everyone else we do like hang around and have a um uh, just to hang out and a chat about tech if you want to if you want to hang out and talk to us but otherwise we'll see you next week just remember that next week's session is about tracking using drones um with debbie saunders um and uh it's at a different time because she's joining us from australia um and isn't quite so crazy as al and rob and happy to do a midnight talk um so we will be on at 1 p.m uk time whatever time that is for everyone else. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone. And we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot, Ma Nigel. And yeah, lovely to see you all. Yes.